Welcome back, second pagers. Welcome to our book club. I'm Phoebe. I'm Phil. And I'm Isaac. Today we get to talk about The Born Identity by Robert Ludlum. Let's get right into it. I think Isaac had our fun fact. Have some fun facts about the CIA, and that will become relevant as we begin to talk about the book a little bit more. For those of you who are not familiar with the Born Identity series, with a quick Google search, the two most found facts about the CIA that the internet seemed to love the most was first, uh, there is a Starbucks in the CIA headquarters where the security is so high that they do not put your name on the coffee. And apparently it is the only Starbucks that doesn't do that. Even your coffee is has a hidden identity. And the second one is that the CIA hired a magician, John Mulholland, as a consultant to write a secret manual of deception. And it just seemed fun, a little magic in there. Then that kind of led to looking at how you start working for the CIA. Found out that the annual average salary of a CIA spy is $95,000, according to ZipRecruiter. Doesn't necessarily seem worth it, but maybe not every spy job is as high risk as what we are thinking about. <laughs> and it doesn't really seem like there is too much requirements to apply as long as you live in the United States, have access to the internet, and are above 18 years old. So <laughs> if it's ever something that interested you, Godspeed. I had a couple of economists that I work with at the Fed that were getting their CIA clearance. And it's such an arduous process that, and this wouldn't be for a spy, this is just someone at the CIA, that they say, when you get hired, don't quit your job because it's going to take an average of two years to go through all of the security stuff as an economist there. So I wanted to know what you, if you guys were a spy, who would you be? We have Bourne, you have James Bond. So all of those are fake. I'm going to pick a real one. Mo Berg, he was a catcher in the MLB, and then he served as a spy in World War II. And there's a really famous book about him called The Catcher That Was a Spy. The Catcher That Was a Spy. Very descriptive title, yeah. And then he actually went to Princeton too, which is cool. The Alex Ryder, not a real spy, but a teenage spy. Something in my teenage years I thought I would have excelled at. I feel like I would be James Bond. He's the coolest. I feel like there is a correct answer, and that is it, for sure. It's why I know there's only only one 007. Yeah, sure. That's a great line from the Pink Panther. I'm 006. You know what that means? Yes, that's your one short of the big <laughs> job. <laughs> I love that movie. Before we get into this book in 60 seconds, I wanted to remind everybody that we are going to be talking about major spoilers and plot lines in this podcast. So if you don't want the book ruined for you, if you haven't read it yet, we recommend that you read the book and then come on and listen to the club meeting and you won't have anything spoiled for you. Also, if you like our videos, if you like this book club, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, on Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So Isaac, I think you were going to summarize the book for us just so people know what they're getting themselves into here. For sure. So this book is about a man who is rescued at sea close to death from a gunshot and head wounds and with no memory of who he is. The doctor that nursed him back to health realizes has, he has some varied qualities and abilities as parts of his memory begin to come back. And the man, without even knowing his name, leaves for Switzerland to try to find out who he is. Once he's there, there is an almost immediate attempt on his life. And he is, as he's from his killers across Europe, his memory comes back in small bits and pieces. With the help of a woman that he rescues, he discovers more about his past and the people trying to kill him. Great summary. Yeah, that was a weird way to say he kidnapped the woman. But. <laughs> Wait, just really quickly before you say why you picked it, Phil, had you guys seen, I have actually never seen any of the Born Identity movies in their full. I've only ever seen The Supremacy. We watched it at Cousins Camp mm-hmm. once and I, I never watched it too. And it makes sense that I have no idea what's going on in any of the movies. 
movies. If they follow the book at all, incredibly complex mm-hmm. story. That's why I picked it though, because Jason Bourne's just super cool. Isaac, have you seen I've the seen movies? the first three, Identity, Supremacy, and Ultimatum. But yeah, I also had a very difficult time following them when I did watch them, and probably only once. And I don't know if I've ever seen them all start to finish. I'm actually really glad, Phil, especially that you said even in the book, it was complex to follow along because at times I would have to, I listened and I would have to rewind because they changed scenes and characters with a lot of subtlety. And it was sometimes confusing about where we were at in the plot line. I put this as a comment. He would sometimes refer to people that we knew their names as not their names, just as the patient or the old man. And you were trying to figure out who was who. I listened and I thought that the reader is really good. I've heard a couple different books with him before. He, I think he helped me figure out who was who with the voices because I would have been pretty lost. I would have liked to have read it just to have been able to see the names instead of hearing the names. Mm-hmm. All the foreign names were very difficult to keep track of. So I mixed up a lot of the bankers and the diplomats of who was who. And obviously I knew it was going on still, but it kind of was like looking at the names, reading it physically, I would have known where I was. Yeah, it was interesting too when I looked up the cast of characters just to see, like you said, Isaac, a lot of them were French names. So then you're not sure what they actually look like and then it's hard to keep track of who's who. But the cast of characters was very long. And like you said, there was a lot of nuanced characters that maybe showed up in one scene, but were actually fairly important to the plot line. So in that cast of characters, it was like maid, driver number two, because they do the whole assassination at what's what was the place called? At Treadstone 71. Yeah, Treadstone 71. And they do that whole killing, which is obviously extremely important, but they never use names and then they're using descriptor title i don't know i found that to be challenging i thought it was challenging with the swiss names and i'm just really bad at foreign names and for the first couple chapters all pretty much all of book one i was a little bit confused about which swiss banker they were talking about i also listened i wanted to listen over the weekend a little bit so i could get a head start and i listened on the train then kept on asleep so that was tough at the beginning but also i think it was because there were so many characters Mm -hmm. that and all of the processes that they were doing were very complex. And I think the author does a really good job at trying to break down exactly how to wire money from Switzerland to France. And then when he's calling the French accountant, that whole process about how intricate it is, I thought was cool, but it, it was definitely mm-hmm. intricate. But at the same time, this was probably, and I don't know, Isaac, I know you and I have both read the Bosch series, and Phil, I'm not sure if you've read it, but I thought, and I know Isaac, you had said not to take the wind out of your sails, but this was, this reminded you, it was reminiscent of this book series, but I thought that Robert Ludlum did an extraordinary job of describing action scenes where I had every other action book I've read you get muddled into what's going on. But this, you knew the exact, they don't karate chop, but you know the exact karate chop that he's doing when he gets on his knee, when he kicks somebody in a certain place. It was very descriptive and I thought very well done in that regard. Yeah, totally agree. It was like you were there. That and the naming of the different places, the streets, the river, um, again, difficult because they're all French and Swiss names, but really cool it was very good and actually that's one of my biggest criticisms of a lot of movie adaptations slash books movies action is so cool but the books are none of that because usually authors know that it's actually not that fun to read about a fight because it's either so intricate that you're like I didn't need to know about that one punch. Or it's like you said, Phoebe, where you have no idea really what's happening. I thought he struck the balance really well as well. So I actually gave it a one on the Michelin scale. I thought it was good. 
I probably wouldn't recommend it. I like thrillers to be more thrilling, more like I can't stop reading it. I liked the 1.5, Isaac. I think that was probably, Isaac gave it a (laughs) 1.5. And the reason behind that is dissimilar to Phil, but still along those lines. I would recommend this to anybody who I know enjoys an action story. I would not recommend this to someone I for sure knows it's not their cup of tea because it's long and they're not going to get into it. Mm -hmm. But I think anyone with even a little bit of taste for this would enjoy it. Yeah, I think I agree with that. But I will say I don't necessarily know. I guess this maybe is my cup of tea. And I enjoy an action movie. I enjoy an action book. I definitely wouldn't have gravitated towards this or read it had we not picked it for this book, but I'm glad I did. I described it as a palate cleanser. I thought going between, especially if you read a lot of fantasy or a lot of fiction, that it gets its plot from being deeply depressive where it's a shock factor. That's the kind of storyline I'm reading if it's fiction. So this was just kind of a... There is nothing else to think about other than the action and trying to figure out who he is and who's after him. I give it a two. I would recommend it. I thought the writing was very good. I would recommend it to most people. I think we can all agree it was pretty complex and it's one that you can't zone out and then zone back in or you're going to have no idea what's (laughs) happening. And one of the things that I did think was pretty confusing, they kept talking about them and Nam or during World War II. And I was just like, there's no way these special agents in Vietnam are relevant right now. But yeah, it was written in 1980. So that makes a lot of sense. But how did they adapt that in the movie then? What war? Was he in the Iraq war or was it just set in that time period then? I don't even remember if he was a, what his origin story is from the movies. I thought this was a very good origin story, actually. Really well done. Yeah, so I guess for my sanity here, and maybe some of the listeners in the club as well could be confused, I'm just going to summarize what happened to him. I know Isaac did, but to the end, so we get all the spoilers. Basically, he wakes up. He doesn't know who he is. He goes to Switzerland because he has that account number written on him. He meets the girl, again, who we've already, I think all three of us were like, this is not realistic. But She helps him along, but he worked as part of an elite group in Vietnam for as a coalition of forces between Australia, France, United States, maybe a couple other allied forces. And they worked on an elite team called Medusa. And then, and Carlos also worked on that team. Is that true? No, I don't. That's not, we don't know if that's true or not. I don't think. I don't think so. Okay, so that's a separate thing. He knew Carlos from something else then, which we figure out at the end when that gets revealed. So then he becomes, he gets targeted by Treadstone 71 to then become this elite assassin where he pretends to be this elite assassin to actually pull out Carlos because he's taking all Carlos's business and giving bad credit to his name, essentially. And then at the end, we find out Carlos is obviously somebody many people know, but we never find out who he is. We know he's an assassin across Europe. Who He's the world's most lethal assassin. Mm-hmm. And Treadstone 71 pure objective was to draw Carlos out and take him off the board. But it was a CIA op. It was a CIA op, yeah. But we don't know. We think that we may know him, though, based on Jason's reaction at the end to who he is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Also, I don't mean to be silly. But Jason in itself, to me, is not a cool name. Jason Bourne, very cool. Bourne, Wait, cool. I wrote, what's Jason? the- No, that's Kevin. Kevin, Kevin no, get a name. No, Keith. Keith. <laughs> Keith. Keith. <laughs> Keith. <laughs> no, but he kept referring Sorry to him to all Jason. the Keiths, Kevins, and Jasons out there. <laughs> we all love you. <laughs> I always think of Jason Bourne. And I guess I never realized how- pedestrian i think the name jason that's part of it i think (laughs) jason statham like jason statham is jason state anyway i I had trouble getting over the whole jason thing which is on me i didn't notice it until you just Um, said it but now that you say it i can't i still don't notice it oh (laughs) no i okay so i do think that bb put i think we have to bring this up do we actually not know who killed jfk 
I don't know where you've been for the last 27 years of your life. What do you mean? That's like the biggest conspiracy of all time. This is going to be very embarrassing that we're putting this on the internet, but I don't, I did not know that. I thought every a, a presidential assassination, like we got that mother. The government documents known to the public say we got him. Oh. Um, yeah. Basically, the big debate is because he got shot in the, the bullet trajectory makes no sense of where it entered and exited his body based on where they thought Lee Harvey Oswald was, or based on where Lee Harvey mm-hmm. was. So there's this person on a bluff, and there's motive. I noticed, Isaac, I, that you said that you liked that conspiracy tie-in. Yes, so we talk about this because one of the tie-ins is Carlos was allegedly given credit for the JFK assassination. Mm-hmm. Which, knowing the time frame that the book takes place, is still very fresh in people's minds. So it was, it was just a cool little tidbit. Had no impact on the actual book, but cool that he was bringing in those that one real life mm-hmm. event. I also liked the head nod to James Bond. I looked this up. I wasn't sure the timeline of when Ian Fleming wrote James Bond, but it was in the fifties, and so then there was the head nod to the elite group of. British agents who do something similar to what Bourne. I think they would have been remiss to not mention that because it is just so similar to James Bond, obviously. I really liked the entire DC add-in. I think it was perfectly timed. It also wasn't... Sometimes when they do this, I'm just like, this is irrelevant. Now we have 20 other characters that no one Wait, cares Phil, about. And when you- the whole DC sphere. So the director of the CIA, I mean, it completely, I think, midway through the book, yeah. it's almost exactly halfway. You get introduced to the director of the CIA, the director at the Pentagon, the National Security Council, and then four or five other characters that are top brass in DC. And I do think usually when books do that, I'm just like, take me back to Bourne and mm-hmm. what he's doing. I would have been so confused about the entire thing if it wasn't told through that aspect, I think. If it wasn't told through the people who actually Mm -hmm. planned it. I also think he did a great job with nicknames and making them really cool throughout the book. Cain, Bourne, the monk. Mm -hmm. Very cool. The DC cast was good, too, because it helped the reader learn more about Bourne before Bourne did. And in a much more stable way. He wrote Bourne, especially as he's having these flashbacks, as an insane person. Which he is, because he can't remember what's going on. And he just has all these abilities to kill people. And he writes him as, oh my gosh, what is happening to me? With just these tidbits of information. And then they flash to DC. And they talk about, oh, we've done all this stuff. He's gone off the ledge. We've got to bring him in, we got to kill all this different thing. So it was, it definitely helped the reader be like, okay, this is what is going on a little bit more than just the insane flashbacks. Yeah, I had a quote, I know we haven't gotten to that section yet, but I thought you guys would get a kick out of this kind of in line of what you're talking about. When the congressman who was basically, they're saying he's just there as a figurehead for the small council meeting that they're having with when the Medusa initially gets introduced, I had to listen to this so many times because this sentence was so complex, but it was just so well done. Okay, so Congressman Efren Walters, out of the hills of Tennessee by the ways of the Yale Law Review, was not to be dismissed with facile circumlocation that dealt with the exoteric of clandestine manipulations. Bullshit was out. Which, I, this whole sentence, I was like, every possible, as you can tell by me reading it, every possible challenging word But I love that all of that to say bullshit was out, which is exactly what the sentence is doing. And it was just, it's exactly to what you guys are talking about. It's shedding light on the fact that they're dancing around this highly elite group of people that nobody really knows about. Some people in the room know about, some people are guessing at. And again, it's just a great way to tie in what the reader's trying to figure out. Whew, glad we got through that. (laughs) Good quote. I actually really liked my quote. The rich always look at prices, if only for the pleasure of dismissing them. Classic rich people. Being rich is not enough. I love to remind myself that I'm rich. So what did you guys think about 
Marie. She was okay. I just thought it was kidnapped her. She was then okay with that. Madly in love. Bit unrealistic there, but I thought it was fine. I thought her connection with Canada was probably useful in the story. Yeah, she was definitely necessary. I don't know if Jason using her as a tool to escape his own death then allowing her to be taken by those first guys. She gets assaulted and almost killed, but then he the only saving grace is that he rescues her and she's forgives him because she he came back to to save her. You could be thankful for that, but not necessary to then tie your cart to this crazy horse. I would have done that, but definitely a necessary character and the sane side to his side of the story. She was right every step of the way about him. You know, what if you don't remember your these things? You only remember them because you're being told to remember them. So she kind of had her finger on the pulse. I thought she was going to pull a Vesper at the end and be in league with Carlos the whole time <laughs> or the government trying to bring him in. So do you guys think he could have streamlined this story in any way? I think the French guy. I don't think we needed the, the general. I think he was very confusing and did actually not add to the story. General I Villers? I was confused by him. So Bourne thought that that was one of the ways Carlos was infiltrating the world elite, but then he wasn't. But then he was because it was his wife. What information was his wife stealing from him again? She was a confidant for him. And she was one of the last layers in the connection to get in contact with Carlos because she ended up being his cousin. And lover. <laughs> Throwback to last week's episode, legal in Venezuela. He's just basically... He was just telling her about the world elite, and that's how Carlos was getting some of his hits. I don't even think that was necessary. It was just like a safe and convenient position to have her. Mm -hmm. I think due to the, they talked about the like massive age gap. So there was, he talked about their assumptions and their relationship, how it would be fine for her to be gone for different things and to have her own phone calls. He was important because they thought Jason and Marie thought that he was the connection to Carlos, but it was his wife. But he was the only telephone number that he got from that pad in the fashion office that worked. So he was their one connection to the next clue. So he was just... Mm -hmm. And then he was willing to help them. Mm -hmm. Because his son was yeah. killed by Carlos, so he had a motive to also... He had connections. I don't know how at this point in the story... Jason would have been able to get Jason would have Jason Bourne would have been able to get to America had he not had his connection or some other sort of elite connection with somebody in the French government. Because again, at this point, he was being heavily sur surveyed and also his any ID that he had was going to get flagged. So General Villers was able to get him to America, which I think obviously was key in the ending of the book. So that could have been another reason why he started to get included there a lot at the end. No, that makes sense. I think maybe why I gave it a one and not a two is because I do think it was, I don't know what the distinction is, but I think it was more of an action than a thriller. And I think I maybe thought it was a thriller or maybe I just like thrillers better there was nonstop action. So I wasn't bored, but I was never like I could stay up all night reading this book. When they, when he was putting together, I guess not as much him, but him and the reader were putting together that his other identity as Kane was completely made up and it was all fictionalized just to be a bait for competition for Carlos that had me. I kept reading. And I liked that part of it the most, the how you slowly discover multiple levels of his identity and each one is took a turn that I was not expecting outside of the CIA agent, but how we got there was cool. I got yeah. very intrigued whenever Alexander Conklin got involved. So the gentleman who had a foot injury in Vietnam and had worked with him in Medusa, who as at the end trying to kill him. That got me very interested because that kind of was the last 
20% of the book where things were getting very interesting. I think from then on, it was thrilling to me. And I really, I will now read the next book because I would really like to know who Carlos is. I thought we were going to find that out. Do you think the whole 17 series, you never find out who he is? It, I, it can't be. The last one was published in 2022, I think, or 2023. Oh. I would assume there becomes a Bond element of multiple Jason Bournes, but oh, that would be my guess. I have no idea. Yeah. I didn't realize that it was still being published to this day. <laughs> when these authors have a good thing going, they just keep pumping them out. Like the Jack Reachers or the Janet Ivanovich, whatever series she writes, she's published like 70 of those books. The only other thing that I thought was a kind of a discrepancy that I wanted to touch on was Marie's boss, when she called him in Canada and he said, come home, he didn't ask, are you with him? He was working out of the assumption that he knew that she was with Jason Bourne, but that never got relayed to the Canadian government. At that point in the story, no one knew that she was with him, I don't think. So I guess the boss knew because the Canadian government was contact with the U.S. government. The first D.C. scene when they're unveiling what is going on over there. And I can't remember what character it was, but one of them was so mad that they had exploited this Canadian woman and had already killed a Canadian person on U.S. soil or on Canadian soil, her ex-boyfriend. Yeah. I think it was the NSC guy. Into what we'd recommend, I recommend the Culber series by David Metzger. Very good. Or Brad Metzger, I'm sorry. And then the other one that I recommended was the Will Trent series by Karen Slaughter. Especially the Culper Ring. Really cool about an archivist and it's a thriller, but it's also read by the same guys. Nice. I recommended The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. I thought that this book read very similarly to The Da Vinci Code or Angels and Demons, if you've read that, all part of that same series. So if you liked this, you would like that. It's shorter, I think a little bit more, it's a little more simplistic in the way it was written, easier to follow along. But I liked this book better than that book. And then I also thought The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, that's a little bit more of a stretch, but I love that series. And I think if you liked this book, you would like that book. I recommended Alex Ryder, who was the spy would be, he's a teenage spy. It's by Anthony Horowitz. I read it as a middle schooler and early high schooler. I don't know how much that captivates our audience, but <laughs> <laughs> then obviously James Bond by Ian Fleming. I've only read the first one, Casino Royale, but very obviously iconic story. And then the Harry Bosch series by Michael Connolly. It's based in LA, but all the naming of the places and the sequence of the action is written in a similar way in that it's very well described and makes you feel like you are in the scene that is unfolding. Yeah. Isaac, did you want to share the quotes that you had? Or I think you had one quote, maybe. I was the old fool is a complete fool. Vickers says that when he finds out his wife it's a good is a relay for Carlos. Okay, cool. So I guess we can go into what we're reading next, just so that people know what's coming two weeks from now. The book we're reading next week is Doppelganger by Naomi Klein. And I actually picked it out. She wrote a book about capitalism before the Great Recession. So the book just became immediately irrelevant, which is super unfortunate for her. This memoir and political analysis contrasts the viewpoints of Naomi Klein and Naomi Wolf, exploring the impact of political polarization and conspiracy theories. Klein uses her personal experiences and political knowledge to dissect contemporary societal divides. It's an insightful look into how identities and beliefs are formed and challenged in today's world. So that's Doppelganger by Naomi Klein. And just as an extra plug, it is also on Bo Stewart's to read oh. list. And I'm currently reading Renegade's Magic. It's the third one in that book series that I'm still reading by Robin Hobb. And then I'm also reading a just a more spiritual book called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. Interesting. I'm reading David Copperfield, which is Charles Dickens' book. And I'm reading that because I read Demon Copperhead, which was adapted from David Copperfield. And I wanted to compare and contrast the two books. It's good so far. I just got started on it. I'm reading Cockpit to Cockpit. It's a book about military pilot transition to the airlines. Seems very informative. 
<laughs> is it a memoir, Isaac, or is it just very fact based? No, it's just a how to, hmm. you know, tips and tricks. Always good to know. Thanks everybody for listening. You can tune in next time. Again, like Phil said, we're talking about Doppelganger by Naomi Klein, and we will see you at the next meeting. Stay classy, second pagers. So, yes.